Signs of the Southland, Monday, August 8th, 2022. We have a bit of a special episode for you guys today. Jake has graciously offered to be Dan Carlin for the next hour or so and walk us through the campus center and student center evolution, so to speak, in Georgia Tech's campus. Uh, before we get into that, just a quick note about some going-ons on campus. Today was DT8 day, since it was 8, 8 Demarius Thomas day, and uh, from all reports that we can find, it will be DT8 day every August 8th moving forward uh, for the athletic program. Uh, the Mannings, Payne Manning, his wife, funded a scholarship uh, after Demarius Thomas passed away earlier this year, tragically passed away earlier this year. Uh, the first five of those scholarship recipients will be enrolling this semester at Georgia Tech. Uh, there was a nice little ceremony uh, at Bobby Dodd Stadium this morning uh, featuring, I believe, those winners uh, and a bunch of Demarius Thomas's family. Um, some nice words said by Peyton Manning himself, uh, Angel Cabrera, the president of Georgia Tech, uh, and Todd Stansbury, the current athletic director. The DT8 logo um, was painted at the 25-yard line of Bobby Dodd's turf, I think on both ends. Uh, it's unclear whether that'll stay for the entire season, but all you know, normal indications of memorials seem to indicate that that will stay uh, for the rest of the year. Um, I don't know if either of you had any comments uh, on Demarius Thomas. Uh, some of these celebrations of life, uh, I think, um, how I refer to them uh, before we get going here. Uh, I mean, it was it was good to see. Hey, we're just good to see Demarius' family on campus again. Uh, for one, I mean, it's not. I mean, there's we're what well, we're in between summer and fall semesters right now, and the summer stuff ended about a week ago. Um, and then move in is this week for freshmen and everybody else uh, before classes start. Uh, so it's a good little quiet. It was a good little quiet time. Um, I'm sure for other reasons, that's probably why it was chosen to done. I mean, beyond this, the date it conveniently placed itself there. Uh, but no, I mean, Tamaris is of the most important stars to come out of tech that went on to great stuff in the NFL and got to play with the arguably greatest quarter at least greatest football mind ever in in Peyton Manning um and it's really really nice that uh he that his family that him and his wife came and you know did this they were here for this funeral I believe as well last year um and so and I mean Peyton over and over has lauded just how incredible of a teammate he was uh in, in his couple years or his few years over in Denver um which I'm sure every everyone that played with DT got the, would be able to know sadly we don't know never got to know him personally or anything like that but um I'm glad we have this there um, to have another connecting point for between the sports history of tech and the other out, I guess the other people that are related to the tech, to the extended tech family. Yeah. I think that was really well said. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it, it's not that I ever interacted in, in a tech sense, you know, I'm, I'm a younger, relatively speaking fan myself uh, in, in terms of coming into the program, but just, uh, kind of admired from afar is not necessarily a, a Broncos fan, but somebody who enjoyed good, well-played football uh, and uh, appreciated uh, it enough to conveniently always be one to draft him on my fantasy football team. So, you know, it's a, it's a very shallow connection, but I mean, it, it just the fact of, you know, the, the power and the, the legacy of, you know, all the people um, that he has touched with his legacy is, is super important. And and I'm glad it's being honored because I mean, that's, you know, it, it, it's a shame and it's very tragic, but at the same time, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a small gesture for something that is a tragedy, but it is a very nice gesture at the very least. Um, absolutely. Uh, some one quote that I did want to share uh, that Peyton Manning shared to SportsCenter uh, and Cole Harvey of SportsCenter, who was on campus today, uh, Demarius Thomas was always giving back and paying it forward to help others. Manning also credited uh, Thomas with being one of the reasons why he wanted to come to the Broncos. So he's just an awesome guy to be around. It had an impact on a lot of people. And, um, you know, it's it's very 
it, it, it's it's awesome to see that tech is you know doing so much to honor such a special guy uh and such a you know a, a really bright guy that just passed away too soon yeah I, especially considering that uh, the mannings especially have, have invested so much in building up this endowment uh for students uh, and helping them start their journeys at Georgia Tech uh, and doing it all in his name, right? Giving yeah. back to others. And that's, sure. I, uh, that's very, very cool to see. Yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly relate on, on a deep personal level with, you know, the, the seizure disorder and all of that as well. And it's, it's something that, like, I do think about a lot because it does personally affect my family and myself. So it's it it's i don't know it, it's a, a representation thing on a personal level too and i think that's something that's really kind of resonated with me i don't talk about that a ton but uh you know it it's powerful i think outside of a football or just you know scholarship legacy type context too just the the, the awareness and i guess permanence of of what they're doing to to help others in a way that you know i think demarius would have really wanted to to make that happen honestly i was also just pleasantly surprised to hear that it's it's five scholarships and, and five awardees yeah um rather than I, I was honestly kind of shocked that's a heck of an endowment so just a, a, a horrible tragedy uh and, and terrifying uh, you know on a lot of levels too but heck heck of a difference they'll make for quite a lot of people yep absolutely this is two very different podcast topics that just by necessity years. needed yeah. to go together today. Um, again, not to make light of, you know, any, any of today's other developments, but uh, you know, the, the, the feature of the day, I would say in, in a, in a very different way that we are unfamiliar in handling the previous topic, at least since Jack came on, I think this is our first history episode. Is it not Jack? It sure is for me. Okay. Well, that's uh, something that I think that we can provide kind of an, an, a unique lens um, to the tech sphere here, because at least in my personal experience, I am a horrible, horrible hoarder when it comes to books. Uh, yes, and so my shelf are. is just littered with with Georgia Tech specific objects, but also some, you know, some other uh, key books. Uh, today's sources, before we dive in, um, that we do go back to a lot. Uh, Akshay and I have kind of taken left turns into history in the past. We, we've talked about, you know, leaving the SEC and and what that meant in the mid '60s. We've we've done some other general Atlanta topics, but uh, when we when we revisit these these topics, if you ever want to learn more yourself, dresser in white and gold, uh, written for the centennial of Georgia Tech is going to be where, um, or not, sorry, not centennial, uh, 75th anniversary is going to be where a lot uh, of detail comes from. It's written by uh, a, is it Robert or Richard Wallace? I always forget. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, by Wallace. It, I think it's Robert. <laughs> ugh, I feel bad. I use a tech grad too, but um, uh, that was, that is a uh, important source for us, but uh, the other one that we do want to shout out is uh, Rob McMath and others uh, and their work on uh, Engineering the New South, written for the 100th anniversary of Georgia Tech uh, in 1985. So uh, in terms of our go-to general tech history sources, that's going to be it. Uh, this also will feature uh, some works and you know uh, items from other places, uh, critically Dean Dole's memoirs, uh, Dean George Griffin's memoirs, and uh, just some other associated sources uh, via Smart Tech and the Library Archives. So before we dive in, uh, today we are going to be talking about kind of the, I don't want to say the history of the Student Center, because, and, and you guys can kind of comment here too, it's more of a history of, I would say, like, outside of the classroom extracurricular life at tech it's, is that a fair it's way a to history put it? of it's a history of student life right it, yeah. it's how yeah. student life as a concept came to be on campus and we were talking about this before we we started recording right there's not much when the school was originally built and we'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail well, it, it was outside of city limits so that just shows you how much has changed Right. And and one of the things that you were telling us is back then when the school was originally founded, 
one of the pamphlets that you were handed when you started at the school was for boarding, right? Yeah. They handed you a pamphlet to go find an apartment and rent an apartment from another per or somewhere in town and then come to come to classes at Tech Tower and the and the old old shop building, right? So yeah. there's we, we start with the story. I mean, I mean, this whole story is about how student life has evolved, right? From literally nothing, right? From the, from effectively zero to being this burgeoning unit, this burgeoning organism, if you will, on campus that leads us to build this new campus center to open it in not obviously not we specifically, but Georgia Tech as a unit building it, building campus center and opening it this this semester next week to the the greater student body. And I think it's it's weird a little bit for for Jake and I to talk about this, right? Because we, I, I mean, we didn't. It, it, this plan wasn't in motion until we left, more or less. Sir, sir, you need to do some remembering because I sat in on some very dry architectural meetings when we I were was in one of those. School, like, I, and I remember that. that. But but think about it. Like, can, when did construction start? Right, That's construction right. started when I when I graduated, and then when you were when you were in your last year at tech right so so what you're saying is we should just end the episode now because none of the three of us are going to experience it and all of this is irrelevant well so and and jack is and, and i think this is a good place to start though right because jack is a relatively new tech history person right i yes. think you're the tech history expert and i'm sort of the the middle ground like i'm a moderator right so okay. let's let's start the story let's 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 lay the groundwork here. Let's start in 1912, right? Georgia Tech is, what, at that point, 30, 30 something years old? 28. 20, 20, 20, 28, 28 years old? from the document, 25 from the doors opening. Sure. So, you know, about as old as all of us are, maybe a little older. Closer to my age than you were. It, it went its entire minority without a library too. So if we're if we're flavoring it in here, it's not it's not like they've been burning down burning down the world in the meantime in terms of what they've offered, right? It's a very it's small campus, era. right? Yeah. It's a very small campus. Basically, all they have is the the shop building. They have the administrative building, which is now Tech Tower, and then they have the field immediately outside. So I want you to sort of explain what campus culture is like at this yeah. stage, right? Lay, lay out what things look like for the average student on campus at this time. Yeah, so there's gonna be a couple parts to this, right? You know, we, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, just getting handed a pamphlet and saying, hey, good luck, go find somewhere to rent. And then having to walk across the like causeway that was North Avenue spanning the valley, um, you know, back into town or, or from town in order to come to school. but. If you want to think about how that evolves, right, kind of alluded to there being a library, right? We're, we're not going to tell you what the name is yet because that's going to be part two, right? One, minimal. Minimalism is the key, right? There's a couple of dormitories. Uh, Nall's dormitory, I think, uh, has a cafeteria by this point too. So there's some access to food as well. Uh, but but this minimalism of tech is is super apparent. It's not a military school at least in the traditional sense of a military school, but it's one that's also run with military precision, right? You're you're very you're living a very cadenced life. It's a very top down leadership structure. Um, you know, uh, until he died on the job, Lyman Hall literally was an ex military man, so I, I guess that makes sense too. But 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 the point is, it's it's a very regimented life. It's a very minimalistic life, and and there's not a ton of options, right? Um, even in terms of the space, right? We we talked. Obviously, library, yes, we talked about the field in front of Tech Tower being your real option there. But uh, apart from, you know, a brief stint in, in the aughts, um, those being the 19 aughts, not the, the 2000 aughts, um, Georgia Tech is still playing its football games off campus too, right? So this big, uh, like the, at the time, you know, you had football, baseball, and, and you know, basketball was kind of intermittent. But you, you have these two sports, right? And and they're playing their games at Piedmont Park, at Brisbane Park, at, at Ponce de Leon Stadium, right? Other than that, that one exception. And, and in 1913, you kind of get a con, uh, uh, not a convolution, that things are coming, it's, it's all coming together, right? Where you're finally having um, not just 
this uh, football being on campus, right? You're, you're, you're playing on Grant Field. It's flattened with convict labor, famously. Uh, they bury the creek underneath. It's now in a sewer. You're starting to see some of the modern uh, modern pieces put together. But you're also seeing um, John D. Rockefeller, who gives tech six figures to go build across the street a YMCA, a building that houses you know various functions, but one that is not inherently... Georgia Tech per se. You're you're living, like we said, this military regimented life. And yes, you have more options, but but I think the the, the big thing that we want to say here, it's not really Georgia Tech providing those options. And I think culturally, um it, it's not it didn't really make sense at the time either. There wasn't the money to do it, and there really wasn't the like it, it wasn't really part of the institute culture to provide that that service and maybe not and maybe not tech culturally didn't make sense but ymcas were like the thing the place you would go to to just do rec stuff like that was just your your place to go just be a human and just kind of have a living room like that was kind of the idea i mean hence basketball formed out of a ymca like that was yeah that's just what that did so i think while it wasn't plugging in something that for tech it made, maybe didn't make sense in tech's specific dynamic in the idea of like well this is just what americans did I think yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and and it's it's something that like like you said made sense at the time, but I think especially with our modern understanding, and it's 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 a little bit of a pitfall to always be applying modern sensibilities to past things. It's it's yes. important to recognize the lens that you're looking from, but you know you, you can't be like oh like separation of church and state, or you know oh like you know why isn't the university not providing all this because there's you know it's. It was a different time, right? It, it, but to us in 2022, saying, "Hey, uh, we're just going to walk over to the YMCA to go get our dinner, or to you know go to this school-sponsored event," that sounds really foreign, at least at least to the three yeah. of us, I would say. Yeah, I think one of the things that you you, you touched on there is that this. Well, well I want to hit on two things, but the first thing is it just covered so many of those needs, right? Not only not only was it dinner, but it was recreation. It was social gathering it was it, it was just this hub of culture and like jack was saying it wasn't just in this town it wasn't just in this part of town it was all across america and so it it, it makes you wonder a couple of things and I, I i like how you phrased that when you talked about rockefeller funding tech to build the ymca right he gives the money to georgia tech who then builds the ymca he, who then builds the building for the YMCA, right? So that they realize the need, but they know that they are not going to be able to provide it given the, their cultural structure. Yeah, and and just to like to flavor it, I, I went back to look at my notes because I think it's really important just to kind of talk about the breadth of what that stuff was, right? Like it's not just a place to hang out or a ballroom or whatever. Bowling alley, a pool room, a barber shop, an auditorium and dorm rooms like that's a pretty comprehensive list of stuff it's an and inn we don't, have, we don't even have a barber shop on the current main campus i mean it's on tech square but like yeah like it had everything yeah and 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 that's a really important thing i think to kind of contrast to the building that you know straight across the street over at tech tower because you know even though now the carnegie library again library funded by carnegie another one of those Northern uh, boosters that was coming and, and giving us money, but uh, you know, to, to juxtapose the YMCA across the street from administration and tech tower is to see on one hand, the place where, you know, now there's starting to be all these options. And on the other hand, I, I think uh, uh, an administration or a mindset that's best exemplified uh, by the insubordinate seniors of 1901, wherein, you know, uh, changes to the schedule were made. A bunch of seniors decided, Hey, we're, we're still taking our day off that we, we thought we were going to get and that we that, that we've always had and they were summarily expelled right obviously this is something that was later compromised on instead of graduating in the spring they graduate in november so like it, it does work out but i think that's just a, a as close to a lightning in the bottle as you're going to get to at least the cultural mindset gap that tech leadership had at the time because frankly the the reason they built it and the reason it was a ymca is because that's like culturally and and uh philosophically what they thought the, the that gap should be right like there there wasn't the concept of that school providing uh all of these frills if you will 
Right. And, and some of the things that you mentioned, some of the physical services that the building provided in terms of bowling alley, pool hall and, and such. I also wanted to touch on some of the uh, sort of the, the student organizations that are running out of the YMCA. Right. You have Omicron, Delta Kappa, ODK that still exists today. Rec Club was running operations uh, out of the YMCA for in, in some bit part. Um the Bulldog Club, which is weird to think about in, again, modern sensibilities, that was also running some sort of operations. ANAC, student government, like these are student life operations that we now take for granted, right, but that are being run off campus. And it's not just, and, and the date of the, that the YMCA is built is 1912, right? You said mm-hmm. insubordinate seniors at 1901. We're talking about 1912, literally 110 years ago, and that's not an attitude this this school shouldn't provide or can't provide in some cases, to, given the state funding situation for Georgia Tech at the time, right? Mm-hmm. We're in this situation where, like, th- this this sort of cultural mentality persists until almost what, like, the nineteen fifties, right? Like, it's it's through the First World War, through most of the Second World War, and I mean the entirety of the of the of the Second World War, and you see that these other organizations are filling are, are filling other gaps, right? The YMCA, we talked about student, like student government, student life, the dean of students sort of area that we now take for granted now. Juniors became another cafeteria that the that kids went to all the time, right? Exactly. I, and I'm sure you can name other other ones too. Juniors is the first one that I thought the of. Varsity, of the varsity, if you will. <laughs> right, right. The, the varsity, also another option for students as well. I, and I think you raised a good point when we were, um, it, it, this ties into what you were saying about, you know, modern sensibilities, right? You raised a point when we were preparing for this, that at the time, student activity fees, which are now managed by Georgia Tech student government, were going to the YMCA, right? You were paying tuition, you're paying student fees, the cut of that is going to the YMCA to help manage all of these activities. And that is not something that we would see Today, I think there would be a fit. I mean, there's a fit over the student athletic fee, which is kind of similar, but like it's just a completely different world, a completely different mindset than what we're used to. And we did get to the point where where people were asking those questions, not to say that, oh, gosh, no one ever asked those. And then we just had a student center. But um, I looked this up on the side just because I was curious, because, you know, what is a take a just random school I thought of Wisconsin off the top of my head because I was just in Wisconsin whatever um, and I know that they have a beautiful union um, student union is what they call it there rather than student center you can pick nits there um, and I was like I wonder when they built that um, constructed in 1928 but the idea first came up to be uh, built via the school by uh, I want to get his name right uh, President Charles Van Hise so the president of the university himself uh, introduced plans for it in 1904. So it's not that it wasn't a thing any university did, but certainly, you know, a underfunded school in the South primarily committed to, you know, engineering and, and general frugality. It like it, it just shows you the, the cultural difference, I think, there from a big flagship land grant. Um, maybe Northern has something to do with it too, uh, school versus, you know, one that's in the South, a younger school, um, less uh, less free cash to throw around. But and, and again, that's why you're getting Rockefeller to fund a bunch of money for the YMCA too. Granted, that's what Rockefeller and Carnegie did, right? They they just went, you know, and and just handed out money, building libraries all around the country um, and and other you know civic spaces. But uh, like that's kind of what kept tech afloat not not to say it was 100 percent that because like they still got state funding and stuff like that but i I think my uh go-to example for this is them just kind of like hitting up aaron french and going hey do you want to build us a textile building like (laughs) like it wasn't just the the it wasn't just the um how do you how do you say it wasn't just the the frills right It, it wasn't just the extras not that a library should be a frill at a university uh, or a college or an institute, whatever word you want to use there, but uh, like basic school functions too need, needed kind of these guys to survive. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a necessity, uh, I think, you know, on top of, 
on top of that. Like if you need the textile barren money to, to open the textile school because the state won't give you the cash, kind of a, a telling sign of, of kind of the, the reality that that early tech was facing too. But again, very different from modern day. Right. So we, we arrive at sort of this post-war era. We're in the 1950s, right? Georgia Tech is getting its GI Bill constituents. It's, it's matriculating those. We move further into the 60s. We have some, we, we have a lot of change in, in, in at Atlanta, in at Georgia Tech specifically. And this is where you see the synthesis of that, uh, uh, really of that movement to build a student center, right? A dedicated student center. That's not the YMCA. So how does this, first let's, let's break out and let's walk out. What is Atlanta? What is Georgia Tech like at this point? Yeah, I, I think the key there, uh, if we're talking about the, the movement to get a bill, because it, it starts before the war, right? It, start, it starts 1939 is when there's rumblings. ODK, ODK had been working on this. President Britain, like this was this was a longstanding thing, right? It's not like somebody woke up in 1965 and was like, oh gosh, we got a new master plan. We got all this land. What are we going to put on it? How about a student center? We don't need a YMCA anymore. No, this was this was a years long thing, and you know, saying 1939, that's that's a 31 year gap. It, it's commonly held to be a 25 year gap, which would make sense post war. But if you're prioritizing and you're a Georgia Tech after World War II, you're looking at a place where okay, there's this huge demand for all of our education in the post war GI Bill era, right? T tech balloons in, in terms of its student population, so much so that they have to go start a whole nother university, Southern Poly, thank you very much, which is now part of Kennesaw. Jack, I don't know if you know the, the whole Southern Poly Kennesaw thing. Could be a completely different podcast. <laughs> we don't need to have opinions about that merger, but- um, There's like yeah, three different mergers that we can do podcasts on at that point. Oh, that's hilarious. I'll comment though. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, like at post-war, it's like people wanted to settle. Like they wanted to do he well, set themselves up for later because they knew oh wait there's not a war for me to go possibly go die in now <laughs> like it's a it was a very different mindset americans got to finally be in and school just wasn't an option for so long and now and, it was like okay i can do this and there's state schools that i can go that will get me a trade quickly yeah and the, and the, and the government is paying GI for it. bill yep. right yes and, yes and the government and who are these veterans right they're they're people that have you know, settled down already, right? This is this is tech building family housing on North Campus to house families because that's the kind of students you're getting. Those those students, and and granted, we've lived in this uh, post baby boom Americana vision of college for a long time, right? It's the oh, I'm in high school, I'm gonna go to tour these schools, and then I'm gonna apply to some, and I'm gonna figure out my major, and then go right there after after uh, after high school ends. When you know, there, there's there's different realities even today, right? You know, going to a trade school is a perfectly, uh, you know, valid thing to do or going to get your associates and building up to credits and things like that, but it doesn't really get focused on. And I think we kind of lose the fact that these the 25, 26 year old dudes aren't really looking as much to have these, these, support, uh, these support functions or as Akshay said, when we were kind of outlining where we wanted to go with this, that that social net, right? They, they already have that yeah. that social net and those interests and those time drains that are off campus that doesn't really lead anyone to rock the boat. And and trust me, the, the right. boat was the boat had been sailing on this path for a long time, right? Like yeah. this, this this YMCA thing, they had that down pat. It was a whole, you know, set in stone type deal. Well, well, 40 years into that thing at this point and whatnot. It's just like, okay, it just is. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So we, and it's not just Georgia, I mean, it's Georgia Tech has that sort of cultural mindset or not cultural mindset, but like th that sort of demographic shift, right? From your usual set of students to uh, silent generation, mid twenties, older, older men, older men with families, right? During the early part of the post-war era, but as we get into the late 50s, into the early 60s, you start to see a, a more of a shift, right? And we see this across the nation as well, right? You have a more progressive generation roll in with the, with the boomers. You have different sensibilities. You have uh, a lot more progressive sensibilities, right? And 
you see this, and it wasn't so much of a cultural shift on campus. Obviously, Atlanta, Georgia Tech is still in the South. You still have some sort of, not repression, but it's still slightly behind the rest of the country. But you still get this feeling of uh, of, of counterculturism or like the desire for new ideas and the desire for healthy, new, sustainable growth on campus as your student population continues to bloom, right? So I, I think that sets us up for how this movement to build a student center really gets kicked into high gear towards the middle part of that decade in the 60s and moving forward. Before we dive into that, I got a question for you guys. Oh, So in the homework I sent over, because I did send them some pre-reading, did you see the technique article title that said ramblin wreck spirit will die if we can't castrate frosh i thought I that was hilarious what? and a perfect I mean, encapsulation it's... of Wait, the it's... attitude change right it's it's you going from these stogy traditions why is ramblin wreck club dunking people in sewers for not wearing the rat caps to you know the the more uh you said it right and and not that tech was the a more super progressive <laughs> institute by any means like it, it we can get into the vietnam war drama or lack of it on campus in a different episode but like you know it was there's still times we're changing right right and, and i think i mean we don't mention this in our in our pre-read we don't we didn't have this in our notes but tech peacefully integrates at this point it um yeah it, it, like it peacefully integrates it it introduces it, it, women are now full-time students, a new name right? It gets a new name. It it represents. Mm -hmm. You can see that the sensibilities are changing, even if the average, the culture of the average student and the sensibilities of the average student are not are tracking slower, right? Yes. And and I think that that's where kind of that that ship sailing straight uh, metaphor comes back into play, right? Because even though that like all these you know realities on campus are changing atlanta as a city is changing too at the same time you still have like the same well harrison was only around for about you know the, the decade of the 60s but you have the same guys you know dean george griffin who first showed up as an apprentice class student in 1912 interrupted by the war but played football mm -hmm. coach track was the dean of students assistant dean of students like he's been here for a long time he's an institution as what his role of Dean of Students was. And at the same time, his counterpart, uh, Robert Commander, Robert Charlton, Charlie, whatever, Commander, um, in, in charge of the YMCA, operating basically these fiefdoms, right? Like the, it, it is, it's something that doesn't really change. I would say, yes, you see, you see Harrison retire. That's, that's part of it, right? But, but until these, these old, institutions really uh, of of georgia tech and georgia tech related association kind of kind of are stepping back in in those late 60s mid 60s era that that things are really starting to change and i, I think another part of that culture you mentioned that that sort of the divisions within campus culture because of uh, the institution of the ymca led by charlie commander it, it's not just the ymca right a bunch of campus culture is also guided by greek life so you your two options on campus are basically be greek or find something to do at the ymca or be an athlete and one of uh, two of those factors ROTC, are in athlete or ROTC, i'd say yeah uh, okay so you have four yeah. you have four options and two of those are extremely limited being greek and being an athlete um, ROTC, you probably just had parents that are in the war and you're a counterculture boomer, probably aren't in, super into that and during this era. And so your other option is the virtual monopoly on student life that the YMCA has <laughs> out of that. And so think about how many kids get funneled into that, right? Yeah. And, and it's important. It, it's a critical detail. I think uh, the way the student center page today words some of its history right there's only like four paragraphs on there but it says that facet in, in particular was founded by georgia tech students they say students not the student center because these are organizations that are so old that they were started by students associated with the ymca right like these these are things that you think of like freshman orientation being a pillar of like the, the you know the the necessity uh, of yeah. coming on campus and that's not really something that was tied at least 
to in my reading, you know, there could be sources out there that that differ, but that seems to be something that was, you know, one of those organizations that, that we talked about that just kind of gets folded up into this weird, not off campus, but also not all the way on campus kind of vibe, you know, a still dean of right. students type situation, but like, you know, empowered by that partnership. They get they get a house that's very much just Georgia Tech. It, it, it is their house to do their things. And finally, mm-hmm. at least that the students get to have a platform, really. The YMC was their own platform. And then you get to ship to this new thing that the students get to make the platform themselves. Right. And yep. we're, we're still working our way towards there, right? We You see yep. Dean oh. Dahl come in. One, I do uh, want to self-correct halfway through. My notes say Facet was 1972. So that is that is student center. Oh, well, but it I saw be, 59. I it, saw it 59. Should be in the orientation period. is 1959. So yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. So, but but this sets the stage. I, I think our discussion here has set the stage for this movement coming to the fore, especially as that old guard moves out, and you have Dean Dole. Um, who we've talked about before as the father of the Ramon Rack, right? Who's brought it to campus and it's still the same car that's driven today. Woo. He he comes on campus. And, and one of the things that he, when we were talking about this earlier, one of the things that he does is like, he comes on campus and he's like, I'm Dean of students, but I'm not managing any student life, right? All of that responsibility has been effectively divested to the YMCA via that partnership. And so it's his now, it's his, responsibility and his mandate his personal mandate to to take on that expansion right to take on that project i would say any is a bit strong of a of a way to put that there and and does uh everyone's favorite or at least my favorite georgia tech figure george griffin just a little bit uh (laughs) up the river um too much short drift yeah too much short drift there um but if we are talking about Dean Dole and the Ramblin' Wreck, I would like to take this moment to plug the shirt that I am currently wearing uh, and take a little bit of a left turn. Because are you I'm doing in, some podcast business? I'm doing some podcast oh business, but I'm doing. <laughs> hey! I'm wearing my uh, Ramblin' Wreck shirt. Uh, from section 103 uh, with the uh, THWG. I'm sure you all know what that stands for. Uh, flag on it uh, as somebody who really loves that car. Uh, the Ford Model A Sport Coupe. I've seen some people recently calling it a cabriolet. It's not. Um, but uh, anyways, Who, as somebody who really did, loves- It's posted so many places. Anyway, <laughs> please continue. <laughs> Including on the history website that Akshay wrote. Anyways, continuing. Um, but not only do I love uh, the wreck uh, and you know everything from, from the color to the detail, but I also love soft shirts uh, and attention to detail. And that's something that- uh, Stephen and the gang over at Section 103 have in spades uh, great shirts, great products. Um, I blew through my budget last year too early, uh, and they released new things. So I'm excited for my budget to reset when football season restarts. Um, I know that I was out last week, but uh, I know that uh, that was probably the first in what I hope is is a long partnership with them because I can speak for all three of us when I say that Section 103 truly great Georgia tech, uh, designs. I, I mean, I have several of their shirts now and, and, you know, hope to only get more in the future, but, uh, great products and, and a great team as well. Uh, Akshay and Jack, anything before we like put the train back on the tracks here? The shirts I, are I, good. I will mention, I did, I did bring up the shirt that I do want. Eventually it's, it's the zipper sweater. That's just blue. And it just says tech that, I, that thing looks very nice. I don't need, I have so many t-shirts that I think I might have to just not buy a t-shirt and just go with some more winter wear. But that's that. That's, uh, yes, that's my, for the my top... two weeks of actual winter that we get in Atlanta. Oh uh, yeah, I know. Uh, Jack, I will say that's actually the first thing I'm going to buy. It's the first oh, thing I'm going to cool. buy next, <laughs> next or two weeks or three weeks or whenever that's going to be. But uh, yeah, no, they, they do great work. Uh, all their designs are quite fantastic. Um, I will say the most compliments I've ever gotten in a shirt. So if you're if you're ever feeling down uh, and you need need a way to uh, you know get you some need positive self love, uh, if you find yourself watching Georgia Tech right football this fall, <laughs> the uh, the I'm a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech uh, and a hell of an engineer shirt. Uh, even in Clemson, South Carolina, got a lot of love from just random people. So I can't um, wear that shirt. Even not an engineer. Even uh, financial engineer. <laughs> Management engineer. Even opposing fans love Section 103. And if that's not the biggest endorsement I can think of, then uh, I don't uh, 
I don't know what else to say, but uh, they do great work and you can always check them out at section103.com and at section103 on Twitter, I believe too. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I'm going to gut check myself now so I don't look dumb. Vamp. We're vamping. We're vamping, We're vamping. During, a, during an ad. It is at section 103. I didn't know if hey, there was an underscore. It, wow. Perfect. Done. Good, Good job, job. guys. You got Fantastic. You head. worked a segue into our bit about Dean Dull, and I am going to segue us back. We talked about Dean Dull. We talked about his involvement with the Ramblin' Rack, but I want to go back and focus on his impact on leading, and not maybe not leading, Right, but but fostering this burgeoning movement to build a student center, to build an on-campus uh, center for student life that he is responsible for it, for cultivating. What are the Georgia Tech-based factors? These micro-level factors that lead to this to him be getting involved and this movement really taking off. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we we can definitely talk about. Uh, you know, those, those big personalities leaving, passing, um, and, and, you know, exiting the, of, of the old guard. But at the same time, you're really seeing uh, a Georgia Tech that's, for lack of a better way to put this, trying to look more like other schools, right? It's, it's not really a coincidence that this lines up almost perfectly with the spinoff or, or the, the bifurcation of the general sciences college at, general studies college it, i forget it off the top of my head because we're really uh an hour deep into uh, a lot of history content here but um basically the splitting of that into the the college of sciences and liberal arts i think co slash something like that was the abbreviation not important and then on the other side uh, the college of management right this is a georgia tech that you know looks at least just a step closer to our or more more our more modern understanding of what a STEM institution should be. And it's not really a coincidence that we're talking about all these changes, right? And, and the changes, as we noted, weren't, you know, they didn't all just, they didn't flip a switch in 1968 and say, start digging, we're building a student center, we're a different school now, uh, just like they didn't, you know, wake up one day and, and decide to split the school in, in, in two. But everything um, at Tech has taken its time. Yes. And, and I think whether you're painting with the brush of, you know, a lot of things are changing all at once. You have to look back to to somebody who has a kind of a progressive mindset, like like Blake Van Leer, whether that's on social issues or school management um, or just how he wants to see things change. You know, the, the name change to Georgia Institute of Technology in 1947 was was probably overdue. But I think between that and maybe maybe throw the throw the stick a couple yards down the line. Uh, a couple of years down the line into the 70s. But that real transition phase of going from the, you know, war and GI Bill aftermath to the, I guess, more modern look of Georgia Tech, it, it's it's kind of something you have to see as, as a spectrum of, you know, you start it with a lot of the old guard in place, a lot of these old practices in place. And you end that with with a school that I would say looks a lot more familiar than it does different to our modern day understanding of Georgia Tech and and the the modern STEM institution. Right. And I, I want to come back to that a, a little bit later as we talk about the campus center and maybe a similar impact that it could have on present day Georgia Tech. But I want to walk out the history of the student center itself. Right. We we know that it opened in 1970. Obviously, they, they put a time capsule in there at some point, too. But what does the funding structure for that look like? You keep saying, like, you know, we didn't wake up one day in, in 1968 and decide to put a shovel in the ground. How does the planning procedure for that look? And how does it actually get built? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the planning is something that you're really going to have to. I, I, I think it, it comes down to just the the realization not only of of, of dull and, and you know the identification of the need but um also just the identification of you know maybe there isn't really a, an appropriateness for to, to use the actual word i believe that engineering the new south uses appropriateness uh, of funding 
the Young Men's Christian Association with state funds, right? There's there's a per capita support that's going to the YMCA that's directly being taken out of Georgia Tech's pocket. Obviously, you can't fund all of that necessarily with, with just that one uh, per capita, but you, you can also, you know, work those state functions, work those student set aside uh, specific fees over a period of years in order to make sure that you are funding this thing. Um, I know that's a little bit vague because I can't remember the exact mechanism off the top of my head, but um, you know, it's, it's something that I think more than, more than saying, oh, now we have this money. It's probably a better thing to say, now we have this leadership. Now we have this uh, a kind of identified problem of, of the overlap with, you know, be between the YMCA being a private institution. We had enough factors here between, okay, we should probably should have this money going to where we want it to go. And their relationship with the YMCA is outdated to put it one yes. way. It's the people that were running that are no longer around. Um, and just, it's a new era and we just, there's just different levels of needs there that the YMCA is just not going to be able to solve long-term. It went from being a want or a nice to have to a need to have. Yes. And, or, or maybe not like alarm bells were getting need to have, but just one that like, okay. They knew, they knew what the optimal strategy, the optimal solution here was, and, and it, it was no longer that. It doesn't hurt that they did just double the size of campus by being essentially granted the south half of Home Park that they didn't already own and saying, hey, here's land, please level it and do anything. Because that's a, tech essentially had a blank slate to develop in, in a way that I don't want to say didn't have a plan because there was a 1965 master plan and, and all that. But tech had a need for space, but not a, I guess, regimented way to put it up, right? It, it, it right. wasn't necessarily something that happened in a cohesive or step-by-step -step manner. It was just go. <laughs> Here's land. Start building. Right. And so they have all this land, but they need to get, you need to fund it, right? They need to fund the construction of this building. And, and like you're saying, they have a bunch of other more academic uh, expansion plans, right? I think I'm, I'm looking at um, uh, dresser and white and gold, uh, here and they're building, let me see the civil engineering building, which is now, I think that civil engineering building is now the English building that's at the bottom of freshman Hill, the engineering experiment station, which is at 14th street. Now, um, chemistry building more dorms, uh, across hemp Hill, right? All of these buildings are going down a hemp Hill sort of right where Tech Parkway and First Drive are now. Um, but the student center keeps getting delayed. There's not, an, there's usually not enough funding for it. Um, I was looking at one link here uh, that you had sent us earlier. And I want to make sure that I get the number on this right. So they had... Uh, the, the Board of Regents in 1954 had authorized $300,000 for a student activities building, and then they would add on to that $300,000 via the student uh, via student fees to provide a financial basis for construction. That was that but, temporary increase that they noted, yes? When they, right, like I the think per so. capita increase? Okay, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about then. Right, and, and, but they don't start ground, they don't break ground until 67, and they don't actually start construction until 68. Right. So what happens? Like, what? why? Why does this take almost 13 years to, to put a shovel in the ground? I mean, <laughs> again, it, it's it's partially the land, but that that 14, uh, 1954, you're, you're still looking at a tech that's, um, you know, dominated by those old partnerships. Right. That's, you know, Blake Van Leer is still president. Dean George Griffin is still he's still. Dean of students for another 10 years after that commander is at the YMCA for another 13. There's, there's really just not the, the impetus in the way that there, there is 10 years later, frankly, I, I think is the, the easiest way to put that. Okay. So shovels in the ground in 1968, uh, well, groundbreaking in 67 shovels in the ground in 1968, originally scheduled for completion in June of 69. I think it took another one year after that to actually get done and then it's immediately added to right the yeah. base building that is sort of the student recreation area this 
quote unquote living room of Georgia Tech gets a new bookstore, another dormitory complex, a it looks like a central electrical switching station, a chilled water line extension, and then a uh, addition to the rich electronic computer center. All of that is quoted from Dresser in white and gold. All of that comes under the tenure of Edwin D. Harrison, who retires just a bit later. But th these, it, you see what it, here, something that tech hasn't done before, right? With the bookstore and the dormitory complex, they are filling needs that they see because the student center building now exists and they can invest in student life. Yeah. And, and, and again, some, some of those dorms, like a couple of the dorms are, you know, East campus dorms. We don't really get out into West campus until, until the seventies, but it, it's, it's a combination. Uh, I think of just having not only the means, but the will, you know, I, I, I don't know. Edwin Harrison, basically built for the entirety of his tenure but 10 years uh it, it's kind of telling that he had to do all of that right it, if we're talking about the 60s you got the nuclear reactor in there too like it's like that there's there's a lot going on right and and it just shows that there was there was a big need to do that and, and i think as you pivot to the future you see that continue right if, if you want to look past the 1970 kind of window that we've set ourselves with the opening you look at, and you see the student activity center um or, you know, the SAC um, over on the West Campus again. Love West Campus. Um, but uh, it, it didn't stop, right? It, it wasn't, okay, now we've got the student center. Now we're done. Like, it, it, it was still necessary, you know, hey, we built, we built Price Gilbert in the 50s. Well, boom, you got to add Crosland Tower because, you know, there, there's a need for more library space. There's a need for more recreational space they built all uh the original like freshman dorm set over on west campus of you know fitton montag caldwell that that whole stretch um all those squares um just because there was that much latent demand for it and there was not the the money or the space before like it, it you know it, I'm, it takes I'm, a, I'm noticing i'm noticing a trend i still noticed it, that for those on campus now we all still notice today of latent demand like that's a great way to put it it's just like we notice we don't it's hard it's hard to anticipate the future perfectly and so you're not going to be like well we anticipated a massive need for health mental health initiatives and so now it's here before it starts so it's like no you, you got to see it before and then realize oh okay it's there now or, or, or the you know our number one in the world ranked IE program has operated yeah. out of the instructional center complex for the I, yeah, last however many years. Oh, yeah, it's just like they're oh, building second. their building. Like yeah, our best school should maybe have a night like one of the nicer, or at least one of the more appealing buildings, and not one that's going to deter people away because oh, they don't be, tell like, that to the aerospace kids or just uh, space I, yes, I or just physical physical space to right. exist in that is right. cr like cramped and crowded and yeah old. Yeah, I don't know. Getting that. that kind of jumped the gun to the tech later from the day. Okay. We'll, we'll get there. Are we there now? I think, or we no, 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 no. We'll, we'll get there. there. We'll get there. I, okay, I think. Okay. I think I can get us there. If you look at it, tech never really slowed down throughout the student center 1.0, if you want to call it that, the when version of the of the student center, rather than the Lewis version. Of the the original, center. like the original yeah. 1970 build student because, center. Because and I think a lot of people see uh, the Olympics as a big turning fa turning point for Georgia Tech, right? And and somewhat rightfully so, right? There was a lot of building that happened. There was a lot of changes. If you want to talk Student Center, you have the the stamps edition. There, there's a lot of of stuff that that happened there. But I, I think it's really like the logical through line from this like this looking glass point uh, of of the early 70s late 60s just just changes that happen and you see Georgia Tech you know it it takes an evolution but i wouldn't say that it it necessarily how do i put this i i, I think it's a more clear cut off to say hey this you know mid 60s to 1980 ish window is a more clear transition point i think right. at least into no, our I, I think modern sensibility of georgia tech yeah i think that makes sense based off what i mean and also just think about the growth of like anything like it's it's a very slow start it's very steady before things i mean before i guess what's what's the curve i'm not a math guy your log, like growth. Your log yeah your exponential growth like it just it, it takes time to get to that point where like understand okay this is even possible 
from micro growth mm -hmm. to like, okay, oh, we can handle this. Okay, now we know we can handle something a lot bigger. And the demand's there to also handle something bigger as tech becomes a more and more appealing option as time goes on. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, I think in that sense, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Every A lot of things grow like this. Why should an institute be outside of that? I would argue that tech really hasn't, for the most part, stopped since then Yeah, either. I think right. At least in terms of like, just stuff that is like come down the pipe. Like <laughs> we're talking yeah. about Harrison finally getting all this money. And, and I think that shows and that the land. more and the land and yeah. your alumni base is building. So you have more to recruit from there. The States kind of becoming more open to, to, you know, providing funding. The federal money has mm -hmm. been pouring in since the end of the war uh, in terms of, but that's, that's a lot of research stuff too. But like you're, yeah. you're seeing essentially like, obviously the Olympics are, are going to be a big spike, but, Arguably, yeah, you great, could say the last to the second part of this, maybe, and 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 you could say the last five years are that you know it's twenty five years later ish, twenty to twenty five years later, and we're seeing hey in you know between twenty seventeen eighteen ish and, and and the present, the entire camp, the entire center of campus just essentially get knocked down and, and, and rebuilt, right? It's yeah, it's a cyclical type thing at the end of the day. Right. And so I think one of the ways that we phrased it when we were preparing is you've moved in 1970 when you're, you you pointed this out too. in 1970, you have that hard cutoff from this very old, this intentionally frugal, this historic pure engineering at heart mentality that has now been replaced with this new, innovative, progressive, expansion minded uh diverse uh well-funded mentality or culture that has been best embodied by this movement this movement to build the student center as a microcosm of that hitting critical mass right and, and it's also students being able to advocate and create on their own account too i don't want to lose that in in the through line of it just being like oh yep now now dean dole was in charge and arthur hansen shook things up like right. And, and Dresser and Wyatt Gold makes a big point of that, right? There was so much work done by ODK, by, by members of ANAC, and all these other student organizations that were pushed, that were saying, hey, we don't want to be in the YMCA now. We want to be part of campus. We want to get all of this stuff. We want to have a central organization, a central meeting place where we're on campus and we're making use of shared resources and we're all working together, right? And it, it's a Herculean effort and it gets over the line in, in, in 67 when they break ground and then 70 when they, when they open the damn thing. Right. Yeah. And, and again, I, I think it's, it's honestly kind of thinking this out and, and stop me if I'm going too far here. If you want to think about it in these general, like waves kind of 25 year ish periods, right. You've got our moment now, if you go back 25 years, that's the Olympics. If you go back 25 years from that, that's this, you know, student center pivot into a more, you know, broad-based STEM university, as much as I like to say institute, it, it's it's more of a university style culture. You go back 25 years, that's the end of World War II. And if you go back 25 years before that, it's 1920. So I think those are pretty convenient high water points at least and I, mm -hmm. I think if you go back 25 years before that to like 1895 i'm pretty sure that was lyman hall's first year as president but we're really getting into the weeds and i did not <laughs> read ahead didn't on prepare that, so. for that one yeah didn't prepare um, for a massive analogy I, I i think it's like obviously it's an oversimplification right there there's things there's through lines in history that are very interesting at the university level right you have um you know like the president type level you have the like honestly a, a lot of history at least in in the world we live in and the world, way we relate to universities is via sports you can see it in a lot of like you know football coach tenures or athletic director tenures and maybe a more modern modern sense of the term but um you know there, there's no clean way to say that different eras or or different you know time divisions are clean at at, at a college level but i think it's at least somewhat interesting to observe that it's kind of like a, a, a 25 year ish high water mark, at least, even if it's not a clear, like era to era type transition. Right. Something's happening. Yeah. Right. And we've now we're moving into this next era, right. And you sort of touched on some of the pieces of where we're going and some of the through lines that we can follow 
as we move forward. This is 2022. This is when the new student center, the John Lewis, John B. Lewis Campus Center officially opens, what, next week? I believe. Let's walk this out a, another 25 year cycle, right? That puts us around 2050, 20, 2057, all right? What are those touch points? What are those guidelines, guideposts that you are looking for to be consistent over those next 25, uh, next 25 years? We'll start there first and then we'll talk about some other stuff. I, yeah. I think it's also telling that we just released a strategic plan document, right? There, there's yeah. going to be, you know, the, the effects of that probably more so on an institute wide scale are going to be something to interestingly see bear fruit in the next 5, 10, 15, 25 years. Um, in terms of, I, I think the thing I keep coming back to is the, like the, the research culture versus like the academic culture, if that makes sense. Obviously academics mm -hmm. and research are, are closely intertwined, but especially being just like a major research institution. Like I, I feel like we're seeing, you know, awesome development in the whole science square development, but like, you know, how, how is that going to, I guess, shift the needle on priorities, funding, just points of points of effort. Right. And, and it's great to be, to be known for research, but like, where's, where's that line in the sand going to be? Cause there's always been, if you look back at tech history, could be a whole nother episode about politicking between <laughs> research and academics or academics yeah. and sports and research, you know, wherever you want to make those, those lines, I guess, in the, the modern American university psyche, like it, it's just interesting. I think even more so than, than the sports thing, where, where that yeah. line and where those researches, uh, research, where those research versus academic <laughs> yeah. uh, well, distinctions think about are going to be. Think about your interest groups and who can, and who even has the levers here. I mean, who, whoever the president is, that'll be a major, major determining factor because they're going to be able to like be the main, the main, main, main person to point the needle somewhere. Um, also, I mean, with this, the, the new plan, I, I mean, they were doing this, the new strategic plan, they were like creating this while me and Jake, while all of us were on campus and they were like heavily trying to figure out what we wanted to be in that too. Like that I was, was, I was on that committee. So yes, okay, cool. we yeah, were, we were trying to yeah. figure that out. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So you can speak to that. Like, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head, like how involved students were in that, in that process and in, in previous versions or some kind of like, all right, students, what do you want here? But it's like, okay, at the very least we know it's really critical to them now that that's a big part of it to to get into the why did jake join the strategic research team i or the strategic plan team i realized that a lot of people that share our interests mm -hmm. don't really participate in committees and student government and things like that on campus so the i think you see yeah. people really silo their interests and i i don't think that's necessarily a good thing right it's like Oh yeah, the Greek guys are the one who goes to sports, or like the club sports guys are the ones who do this, and the gals who are in that, da, 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 you know, like the it, it's just a very siloed like set of opinions. So I I, I kind of went for it because I figured not many people that ran in the circles I did would would be a part of it, and I gotta say I was pretty correct, but it it isn't. I don't know. It I don't think it's something that like landed one way or the other I, I i think part of the appeal of of georgia tech to a lot of students especially ones like us that you know now have a sports podcast is that it's a place where you can go and get a great education for people like like akshay yourself jack and, and yourself too where you can be in state and get it at tremendous value um but also um you know all, all the the academic and like research synergies kind of line up with that sport interest too. Like mm -hmm. it's just a very unique concentration of, you know, the, the things people look for in an MIT or a Wash U, but also things that people look for in an Auburn or a Clemson. Like it's, it's just a, I wouldn't say that any one voice dominated. And, and I think when you're thinking strategically, you can't let that happen, right? Research right. and mental health and, you know, physical activity and sports and academics and, and all the politicking that goes on at every level, uh, alumni support, whatever it is, you know, all, all of those things are going to have to come together to have a comprehensive strategic plan. I want to walk out what you said about the academics and research, right? Because we're seeing 
Georgia Tech and its new master plan start making more expansion plans outside of the current campus footprint, right? They've heavily invested in Tech Square over the last two decades, mm -hmm. right? They're building it, it Scheller and Scheller Tower and the new IE Tower are coming up, but and that's more student and academic space. But more importantly, or, or at least more the most impactful investment is what's going on in what was formerly known as, as Technology Enterprise Park, right? That's mm -hmm. going to be developed into an entirely new district of campus, or, or at least Georgia Tech, maybe not campus per particular, called Science Square over the next 10 years, basically. But none of that seems to be student space, right? None of yeah. that is academic buildings. It's all research or it's public-private partnership space, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's corporate offices. It, it, it changes the dynamic of a institution's relationship with their city, with their context, right? When you're investing in this sort of public-private partnership space. And it also changes the relationship uh, of the institution with, with their students, right? Because th that's a massive expansion of, of Georgia Tech, like I said, but not an, a massive expansion of campus. Yeah. Right. And it still is a big, it, uh, but even though it's not like directly academic, that still is a lot of touch points for students that are going to be newly available at the same time. Oh, right. Yeah. Like, and, but so, about, I mean, yeah. it's, it's not like the nuclear reactor for the most part was accessible right. to students when that was a thing. So it's not like, I mean, yeah. and maybe yeah. that's me picking the most obvious example of, <laughs> hey, a lay student who's not an NRE or specifically right. involved in research going on there yeah. can go there type thing. But like, it, it is a, it is a lot bigger than just, well, I don't want to say just a nuclear reactor, but like right. it's, it's a whole sub district. And, and I think you can see it, it, it has the so much potential in the same way tech square did, but like yeah. tech square had the bookstore and the hotel and like, you know, you yeah, know, this, this space is gonna be, it's going to be, it's going to be one of the first spaces. That's not where tech is having to go into other places to connect their students. They're going to bring, the people and the companies to them in their own actual space. And I think they did a good job does of that. with Accenture and what no it not, but this will be there's no there's no distractions there. Like it's just that. It's not you're not doing classes, you're not eating. Like it's just this thing. And it's biosciences. It's not like it's like, oh, this right. is yeah. The like hello, just, uh Milwaukee Drill Company. You can have a public private partnership yeah. in Science Square. Like it's it's it yeah. seems at least to me in, in all the publicity I've seen. No, I think that's fair. No, 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 Scheller's no. kind of got a stranglehold on Tech Square in, in some regards in that sense. Right. Scheller, Scheller in the College of Computing, because there's a lot of a lot of sort of those innovation labs that, uh, you know, put up their flags in um, in synergy with there's yeah. Delta in there. Accenture has their name on the building. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, that's ATDC, one of the things that I can't sleep on ATDC. ATDC is in there. That, that's one of the things I want to say uh, when you were commenting on on that, Jack, like. Synergy is sort of your tech side of the tech in the you know industry sense side yeah. of campus. And now you have Science Square, which is going to be your biomed side of mm -hmm. your biomed, your biosciences side of campus. And you've seen more and more investment ever since the founding of the bio biomedical engineering major in the in, I think it was the late 90s, right? You're starting that could be late. a whole podcast on its own too. And for that one, we would turn to one Dr. Wayne Clough because his memoir is loaded with great detail on that. For anyone who hasn't read that, I would recommend it. It was a, was a very pleasant read. Right. But I, I want to sort of tie, tie this all together and, and make this big point about the new Georgia Tech that we talked about, right? The, the divide, uh, the new Georgia Tech that arose out of that divide in 1970, you're seeing this emphasis on expanding different facets of, of not, maybe not campus life, but different facets of tech's offerings, right? Mm -hmm. You saw, we, we, you mentioned, Jake, the, the expansion to management. I only have a degree because the College of Computing was founded in the 90s, right? I, a lot, a couple of my friends only have degrees because Wayne Clough founded the, you know, the biomedical engineering major, and that has turned into one massive building on uh, in the middle of campus, and now this entire other partnership, right? It, it, well, one massive building on the campus, an entire segment, an entire like fourth of campus of their own buildings, yeah. and now this entire campus to make sure everyone or this entire other sub district 
to make sure everyone on that fourth of campus now has easy access to employment. But right? but th there's one critical, critical, critical difference that I think in particular Science Square does address. And that is the fact that Atlanta right now, despite having the Emory Tech wanted BME school, really doesn't have a life sciences like major. And, and you have the CDC too, but like in the sense of like, you know, Raleigh being, uh, you know, big for that or the North Shore of Chicago in Atlanta doesn't carry that same cachet. So they're mm -hmm. kind of building it from nothing. And while it's maybe a bit of a stretch to say that, you know, management did that for Midtown or, or something like that, but it, it didn't hurt, right? Like it's, it's taken tech being seen as a, you know, great pipeline for, you know, computer scientists like yourself, Akshay, for Microsoft to say, hey, we're getting so many people there. What's the deal? Hey, the economic climate is favorable for us to invest. We have a great pool of talent to draw from for, you know, for them to be putting down these huge campus routes that they're doing or, or Google to be doing the same. And, and I think that's really something that Georgia Tech, maybe not unique uh, to itself, because, you know, you're always going to have you know, the, the classic example of Silicon Valley, right? It, it's you, they'll, they'll never, at least in, at least for what I can portend be another like whole Silicon Valley, but it's kind of accomplishing the same thing on more of a micro scale. Right. And, and that's right. Georgia tech going, Hey, it, it, in the same way that it, it is growing that life sciences, uh, in this specific example, I think the longest term play is for them to see on the, the Southwest side of campus, kind of a similar effect to what we saw in Midtown with Tech Square. Cause you gotta remember when, when Tech Square was started, it was a barren was place. That, not that it was- No, no, it was a wasteland. But like, it was, let's call a spade it, a spade. It was a wasteland. And like, obviously West Midtown is is booming, um, but like, it's it's still not, it's not it's not Midtown, right? That that stretch over there doesn't look like the other side of campus does, and it's cut off from campus in a very similar manner that the downtown connector was slicing tech uh, away from Midtown, and Midtown mm -hmm. still blew up, like in in a good way. Um, yeah. and, and I think with investment, right? You know, reconnecting across, getting rid of that silly flyover intersection at Tech Parkway. <laughs> Tech Parkway and Northside is is a great start to start building the grid back to to Northside, and then from there, yeah. you're 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 making a couple of connections across the tracks, and it's really making a more connected Atlanta in a way that tying it back to that urban renewal, you know, Tech was able to essentially build its way into being secluded, right? It, it, whether it was kind of the no man's land of Techwood homes to the south, the decaying home park after Atlantic Steel left to the north, and then the train tracks uh, on one side and, and the highway on the other. Like this is, it, it really seems more than anything like Atlanta maturing and Georgia Tech trying to have a, a card in that. And, and yep. it's a little bit yep. of a stretch to say that the John Lewis Campus Center is helping do that. But like, it's a useful lens for us to say, hey, what have the last 25 years shown us? Yeah. Tech Square is a great example for us to say, you know, hey, this is a Georgia Tech that first grew away from Atlanta as Atlanta grew around it and now is trying to essentially tie it tie itself back in, right? Like this is this is Georgia Tech trying to I don't know, to serve its mission in a way that's not just churning out undergraduates with degrees, I think. It's progress and service. Right. Yeah. It's progress and service. Yeah. And I know we have a new motto now. I'm never going to bother to actually pick it up. They didn't um, change the motto, did they? What? They no, like probably it. did. They, they, it, I'm new vision sure statement. The, new vision statement. They never I thought it was in the packet that you helped put together. Anyway, my, my, my point is it's progress and service, but it's a new lens, right? It, it's we, 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 you, you get hammered home with that progress and service bit the entire time during your application process, right? You have to write an essay. I had to write an essay about it. I don't know if either of you did. Yeah. Um, I don't think I did. Damn, Still says statement. progress common and app. service. I was common website. app though. Yeah, I was also common app. But, but, my, oh, but oh, my point yeah. is that you get hit over the head in not only the application process, but a lot of your, like a lot of student orgs still try to strive by that, right? I, I, at least Jake, Jake and I, I can speak for both of us that Rec Club did its best to live up to that motto. And it's exciting, I think, to see 
Georgia Tech live up to that motto, not only in its insular, like training its students to do that, right? You're training its students to progress technology, progress medicine, what have you, and serve their communities, but also Georgia Tech is serving its community better. It's it's getting better at serving its community. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very true. And I, and I think to tie it back at least a little bit to specifically the student center, I think one thing that is important is to see how those student needs have changed over time, right? At Jack, you made a great point about you can never like necessarily uh, predict things happen before they do, right? Like if it, if you could have a, a crystal ball and, and see into the future, people would, but it, it's just right. not going to happen. But it's about enabling the space to do that. And also just yep. um, like it's, it's trickle down stuff too. just having more space to provide more resources, to provide programming space, even something as little as, you know, hey, now we don't have to block off the top two floors of the CRC um, for, you know, a week and change of a year every year. And we move that to the exhibition yep. hall like that. Those right. are just ways of you know, better providing, uh, better reducing scarcity of, of, you know, access and things like that. Like that's obviously that's a probably a little bit of a specific example there, but it, it, it's just, you know, it, being able yeah. to kind of grow and change with it and being, if not proactive, at least less reactive to, to, yeah. to those changes. Yeah. I don't know how close we are to wrapping up, but at least for people to, to to tangibly see the fruits of where this all is going with the new with the new student center, um, it because it, it, I've been in all, all three of us have well I've, I'm the only one here that's been in both now. Um, I've been in there a couple of times, and the new one is far more of a platform for students to just do whatever they need to do, whether that is relax or actually do real work or practice a trade, get good at something. Um, produce content, the radio station and all the student media have moved into there um, versus the old student center, which had a lot of those, but it was also um, kind of restricted to like the kind of meeting space there was, um, the food that was offered, um, what you could even use the space for, uh, how easy it was to even get to certain places, like to get to paper and clay was a, was a maze to even find the room for that. And some of the meeting spaces look like 1950s business CEO rooms like it was really creepy to go into some of those rooms there and was a hidden really... piano up there that was nice but i yeah, agree with yeah. you otherwise <laughs> yeah it's like it just didn't match it also it just didn't match what the attitudes were I mean, it, it felt very old tech in a lot of ways of just like very mundane just get to work and leave kind of stuff and right now the new spot a lot of windows you can see everything the direct garage will be right there um far easier to get in and out of um food options are better i would say um that's personal preference though um, so, I mean, yeah, for, for those that get to go eventually, I think you'll be able to look at and s you'll be able to see kind of feel, I would say, feel the flavor of the building. Um, also, if you can find the, 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 uh, the time capsule, it is in there. I did find out where it got moved to. So I'll let people find that as a treasure hunt, but yeah, Jake, I was going to say, Jack, we have a specific word, uh, for the architectural themes of the last 10 years at tech. And I call that cultification. Colcification, it, it yes, that is correct. That the that's... sound you heard, what did they... the sound you couldn't hear in the background was me slapping my face very, very <laughs> the, hard. What did they do to the IC in 2019? Boom. Only cultified. the interior. Only the interior. Only the interior. Only not the, the outside. interior. But yes, no, it yeah, yeah, it that's that's yeah. If you want to take your history lane, walk to the Colk, watch the walk to the exhibitions exhibition hall, follow it to the student center and a few other buildings, and heck, heck even Scheller to some extent as well. And you'll see what we mean. But yeah, I think you'll, you'll be able to see, I just, I guess what the flavor of tech will be like for the next 25 years until the next big thing, whatever that might be. Um, yeah. That's at least immediately on these. I mean, I think all these every 25 year parts have been like stuff there on direct campus. Um, at least it, current. It's going to be really interesting to see what that need is going to be over the next 25 years too. Cause yeah. you look at it as, wow, we just built all these new labs. Kolk. Oh wow, we just renovated the entire library complex. Yep. Oh wow, we just redid the student center and built a, essentially a secondary outpost of it. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. Every every that, every new addition has just expanded the amount of space as to be a platform for students to just do what they need to do yeah. to do progress and serve in whatever way they need to do, and for the campus to do that to the students as well. Yeah. 
Hey, I'm ex- I'm excited for rampant speculation of building construction. That's my yes. that's my favorite part of the year. Construction so. corner will never die. Construction corner will never never die. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for helping us walk out the story of the YMCA, the original student center, and now the campus center uh, is again scheduled to open later well, later this month basically well you can go uh, there now it's open for it's the chick-fil-a is open at lunch <laughs> oh crap interesting yeah. okay that's 11 to 4. <laughs> jake we might have to make a pilgrimage over uh, anyway should have done that thank- today man i was free <laughs> gentlemen thank you uh any final notes before yeah. we head out today yeah before we do all of our plugs and things uh, i will say um in a convenient bit of synergy uh for our next week episode uh, the white and gold scrimmage is the 14th of August. So coming up in, well, I guess five days from when this gets released, but mm-hmm. um, coming up very soon, it'll be at 4 PM uh, O'Keefe, the whole uh, great way to check out the team before their season starts officially, but you can check this space out next week for your uh, 2022 volleyball preview. And I will leave it at that. Uh, but you should definitely tune in Jack and Akshay. You can say whatever you want about it, but I'm excited. I'm looking forward to their season. We will have, I'm not going to spoil uh, what we have going on. Maybe we Jack have two wants to. I'll just say we have two parts to this. It's going to require two different recording sessions to fully make this. Scheduling is going to be fun. Happen. Scheduling is going to be fun. I may have to take off some work, but it'll be totally worth it. I mean, uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay. No spoilers. <laughs> Stay tuned. All right, Mr. Grant, take us home. Yes, uh, I would love to, before I take us home, thank once again, Section 103 uh, at Section 103 on Twitter, Section103.com. They make tremendous goods. Uh, they are great friends to not just uh, this uh, this podcast, but uh, great Twitter friends of uh, the sphere as well in terms of the Georgia Tech. Um, but what do you call it? Just the the vibe? Twitter it's universe. Tremendous. I love Georgia it. Tech, it, it. The Georgia Tech Twitter Institute not just great products, but also great content. And you know, that's what we strive for from the rumble seat too. So I feel like there's great synergy there. Anyways, um, in terms of our bits, uh, you can find this fine podcast at from the rumble seat.com. That's where all of our analysis content and, and, and all the good stuff that we produce gets posted uh, as football season heats up. Be sure to check out all the football content because there will be a lot of it, uh, including uh, returning once again, Uh, the Binion Index, and all of our analysis. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Uh, You can also email us at from the rumble, uh, wow, from the rumble seat at gmail.com. We do read all of those, whether it is mailbag submissions, uh, ideas for content, uh, interest in what the site could cover, and all of that uh, definitely is appreciated. Uh, You can also find us at FTRS blog on Twitter. You can find myself at jgrant98, Jack at Jack Nicholas, and... With that, it has been great speaking to you all. Uh, Like, listen, subscribe. Find us on Anchor and wherever podcasts are sold. And have a great night. Go Jackets.